Okay, yes. Okay, so just a quick announcement regarding your midterm. Uh, the TAs finished marking their questions, and they just gave them back to me, so I have to mark my portion. So I have to mark the last two questions. Um, in terms of when you'll get them back, you'll probably get them back by latest next Wednesday, but I will put up marks before then. The reason why I want to wait till next Wednesday is because there were eight people that called in sick, and I'll use that very loosely for the midterm. So eight people actually said, yeah, I'm, I'm sick, I'm not going to write the midterm. So I'm going to issue their makeup next Tuesday, optimistically, I have to wait for the department, and then I'll mark their stuff, and then I'll give you back your midterms on the Wednesday. But for those who actually legitimately showed up on the Monday, you'll get your marks before then, except for them. So uh, marks will be posted hopefully by end of this week, if not Monday the latest, you'll actually get your physical midterms back on the Wednesday. So um, I'll just keep bringing them to class until you pick them up. Or you can come by the office if you wish. But uh, physical copies, not till next Wednesday. Marks, hopefully by end of this week, if not next Monday. And then physical copies in the next Wednesday. Okay? So just wanted to point that out. Okay, so just a quick review before I carry on. Uh, I did abruptly end with uh, the FM spectrum of a single tone wave, but let me just review that quickly before we carry on. Is the next part of this conversation, conversation is going to deal with this stuff, right? So here, here's a quick uh, overview of what we covered just briefly before we finished. Uh, okay, so we've got uh, a message signal, which is just a single cosine wave of a, of a known frequency, which is known as omega m which is 2 pi fm, which is the frequency of the cosine that you're looking at, okay? And there's a constant amplitude for that particular cosine, which will assign to be a sub m, okay? Uh, if you, so if you don't remember the derivation, don't worry about it. Uh, just for a single tone wave, okay, the, um, the uh, modulated spectrum in terms of time domain can be represented in the following equation. So you basically have a linear combination of cosines at uh, multiples of your uh, fu of your fundamental frequency for the cosine that is centered at your carrier, okay? And then it's weighted by some constants which are known as J sub n, which are known as the Bessel coefficients. So they're a function of the modulation index, all right? The modulation index is defined as delta f over the fm, which is the frequency of your message. And delta f is what's known as the frequency deviation. So this kf here is your, uh, it's, what, it's your deviation constant. It's how much or how little your, um, you know, it, it's, it's like a gain of how much your frequencies will increase or decrease, you know. So the bigger the constant, the more your frequencies are expected to increase and vice versa, all right? So these two equations are what you need to know. And these, co these coefficients here are a function of your modulation index. So uh, this is very important. And we'll talk about that later, okay? I also like to note that um, the Bessel coefficients have even an odd symmetry, okay? So this relationship is what you're going to need to know if you want to do the pre-lab for the FM uh, pre-lab that's going to be due next week for some of you, okay? So note that negative values of n are, they're what's known as their alternating symmetry. So basically, it'll go plus, minus, plus, minus. Okay, so you, so you should probably, um, you know, uh, keep, keep that into account. So it'll be, you know, so j of n1 and then j of n minus 1, it'll keep alternating back and forth, okay? All right, so that's uh, that's something you need to know as well. Let's see, what's going on here? Oh, sorry. Oh shoot. Okay, my uh, mouse is frozen. Hold on a minute. Let's go. To... That's weird. Okay, let me just pause this for a minute. My uh, mouse has gone kaput. Nope. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Let's go back up. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Okay. So here's the equation for the spectrum, okay? So um, if you wanted to find the FM spectrum of a single tone modulated wave, that's what the pre level asks you. You follow this equation here. So I believe it asks you in frequency, but I also put it in omega just in case. The only difference is that the way the uh, impulses are weighted are by either AC pi for omega or AC over 2 for F. Okay? Also, the frequencies, of course, will change. So all you're doing here is you draw a bunch of impulses you know, that are centered at your plus minus the multiple of your frequency of the wave. Okay? And I'll, I'll do some examples uh, uh, later next week. But this is the equation that you draw. So um, if you have a you know, wave of some frequency, basically you draw a bunch of impulses that are weighted by you know, best cells, and then the number of coefficients you include, I'll talk about later in this class, but you draw them up to a certain point. So this is the equation that you'd use to actually draw the actual spectrum. So I believe this is the one that you'll probably need to use uh, for the pre-lab. Okay, so everything's weighted by AC over 2, and then you have plus minus uh, multiples of your fundamental frequency centered at the carrier. 
whatever that is. Okay, and they're weighted by the best cells as well. Okay, so let's continue from where we left off. So this is what happens during the uh, narrow band situation where your modulation in X is less than 0.3. If it's less than 0.3, then what's going to happen is that there are only going to be two coefficients. Okay, so you have J of 0 and J of 1. Let's see what's well, of course, it fucks up again. Okay, hold on a minute. Okay, sorry. Okay. I just will not go to full screen then. Okay. So, uh, so this is what happens uh, during the narrow band case. All right, so this is when beta is point. So there's only going to be two coefficients. So one at j of 0 and another at j of 1. Okay, then everything else after this point is going to be, you know, negligible. All right? So... So here, you know, the J of 0 is approximately equal to 1, all right? That's assuming that your modulation in X is less than 0.3, okay? And then the other ones are going to be plus minus beta 2. So that's, this tells you that uh, the positive side will be beta over 2, and the negative side is uh, minus. Okay, so that's what it's telling you over here. So there's, there's going to be one impulse centered at your carrier, and then two impulses that are plus minus the frequency that is given by that particular cosine wave that is centered at that particular free, uh, at the carrier frequency. Okay? So anything greater than that, then you just ignore. So the spectrum is going to look like this. All right? So... Okay, you know, I need to stop using my mouse. I'm just going to stop doing it from now on. Hold on a minute. Okay, sorry about that technical difficulties. Okay. So uh, for the narrow band case, all right, uh, so this is what happens when you take a look at the spectrum for when beta is less than 0.3. So this is the, uh, you know, this is the spectrum, this is the signal, you know, that you're expecting in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the modulated spectrum in time domain. And then because beta is less than 0.3, there's only going to be two, there's only going to be, um, you know, two, one pair of coefficients, which is at plus one and minus one. And then you have zero as well. So it actually boils down to just this expression. So you have, so it's basically a summation of best cell coefficients, right? So you have J of zero, which is over here, and that's approximately equal to one. And then you have two of these guys here, which is approximately beta over two, or plus minus, depending on what, you know, number you're looking at. So this one is when N is equal to one. This is when N is equal to minus one. And then this is when N is equal to zero. So this is what your spectrum will look like for the narrow band case. Uh, you know, when it's less than 0.3, there's only, you know, two pairs of coefficients there. So, so if you actually take the Fourier transform, there's going to be one impulse that's centered at, well, two impulses that are centered at plus minus omega c, and then another that, are, that is centered at, you know, omega c plus omega m, and then omega c minus. So there's six impulses altogether, three on the left and then three on the right. Okay, so as I talked about, we have your carrier, and then you have your, you know, one sideband centered at, omega, you know, FC plus F of M, or omega C plus omega M, and then omega C minus omega M for, you know, for that, you know, so there's, you know, so there's, you know, plus and then minus, and then you have the carrier as well. Okay, so the transmission bandwidth is actually twice the frequency, you know, twice the fundamental frequency, which makes sense, right, because if you have... One impulse that's centered at omega c plus, and then you have another that's centered at omega c minus. If you subtracted these two together, right, and then minus, right, you get twice the message, which is what you get here. And that's in terms of omega, but, you know, you can do it in frequency as well. So that actually makes sense. So if you, for the narrow band case, the bandwidth is just twice the frequency of your message. Okay. So technically, because the Bissell coefficients are an infinite summation, there are an infinite number of sidebands, you know, that are at plus minus, you know, um, at, you know, n times the fundamental frequency. So you can go from one, two, three, up to as many as there are. So there are an infinite number of sidebands, but, but, you know, we want to consider this in terms of a finite case. So there's got to be some criteria that we can use to cut off saying, okay, we don't need this many, this many sidebands. All we need are, let's say, eight or ten, or you just need to determine how many sidebands you need and until you, you know, before you stop. So the magnitudes of the sidebands, it decreases as you start increasing the n, which actually makes sense. Okay, so if you actually take a look here, uh, so depending on your, so the horizontal axis is your modulation in x, and then so, and then as you start increasing n, so this is when n is equal to zero, and then this is when n is equal to one, and if you keep going, all right, what will happen is that the magnitude, the actual, you know, the actual, um, the, the numbers themselves will get smaller and smaller and smaller, which actually makes sense. Okay, so the power of the 
frequency modulated wave is actually contained within a finite bandwidth, which actually, which actually makes sense. Because what you're doing is that you're only modulating the frequency of your carrier, not the actual amplitude. So because the height of the carrier stays the same, you'd expect that the power is just whatever the carry is squared divided by two. It's just the power of the actual carrier itself. Okay, so you'd expect 100% efficiency. So the carrier amplitude, if you remember what the equation was, you have AC and then it's weighted by whatever you know, that constant would be. So that's what the carrier amplitude would be, right? So you had uh, a summation of you know, cosines and then the carrier would just be J0 and then beta. Okay? It's a function of the modulation index. And then the total signal power, if it makes sense, because if you, want, if you remember from Parseval's theorem, if you want to figure out what the total signal power would be, all you have to do is you know, find the area in terms of the frequency domain. So you can actually find the power by just you know, um, taking all your best self coefficients, squaring them up, and then just adding them up. So this summation here actually sums to one. It's just a property, you don't really need to know that. All you have to do is really just remember this. It's all you're doing is you're just taking the carrier squared divided by two and that's the signal power. So you'd expect the efficiency to be 100% because you're not actually varying the height of the carrier, it's just the frequency that you're trying to vary instead. So you could have, you know, you could have easily obtained this result from, uh, you know, this is the general equation that we have, right? So this is your carrier and then your message, you basically integrate your message over time. So you're just finding whatever the integral is, you know, slap your sensitivity constant and then that would be what your frequency modulated wave would be. So, you know, th this is just a review from last time. And then uh, let's see here. So the total signal power, okay, what's gonna happen is that it'll actually change as a function of the modulation index actually. So the actual distribution itself. So as you start increasing the modulation index, what's gonna happen is that um, the total number of sidebands was also going to increase. Okay, so as you make the modulation index large, so if the, you know, the actual, um, you know, the deviation of the frequency from the carrier, if it actually gets bigger, then you're gonna have more impulses, you're gonna have more sidebands with respect to the actual carrier frequency, all right? Okay, so here's a you know here's just a uh, just a quick uh, pictorial representation of what's going to happen. So um, if you start to change the modulation index, what'll happen is that the spacing between the impulses is going to get wider, but there's going to be more. There's going to be more impulses. So this is what happens. So as you uh, change the modulation index, actually actually I was wrong. So if you actually make the modulation index larger, and then if you actually make the fundamental frequency shorter then what's going to happen is that, so this is what happens, so if you actually change one of them, you actually make the modulation index well, larger, right, what will happen is that the fundamental frequency is going to get smaller, okay? So if you do that, then more spectral lines get added, so which actually kind of makes sense. So that's what's happening here. So the spacing gets smaller, but you're going to get more impulses, you're going to get more, um, you know, you're going to get more, you know, sideband, sideband impulses, right? Similarly, if you make the modulation index large, and then also, you know, if you actually make the, uh, uh, let's see here, with the, ah, okay, so if the frequency deviation increases as well, then you'll get more spectral lines, but then there's a constant spacing. So they actually, what's, it'll kind of get wider too, so it'll look like this, all right? So, so here you get the same number of impulses, but the spacing between them is going to change. Okay, so if you make your, you know, your fundamental frequency smaller, it kind of makes sense. The spacing between the impulses gets smaller. And then if you actually make the fundamental frequency larger, actually I would make this, this is actually f of m. If you actually make the fundamental frequency larger, then you'll see that the spacing increases as well. So as you change the modulation index, if, if you change the you know, frequency of your message, uh, if you make it smaller, the impulses will get smaller, the spacing gets smaller. If you make the fundamental frequency larger, then the spacing is going to get larger as well. Okay, so here's the question that we've been asking us, you know, asking ourselves. So how many sidebands or how many coefficients or how many impulses do you need before you stop drawing it or you consider, okay, after, after this certain point, that's enough. I don't need any more. So this is the question that we need to ask ourselves. You know, how many sidebands are significant to determine what your bandwidth is for your, fre for your frequency modulated wave? So here's a good common rule that a lot of people use. What you do is you'll take a look at as many coefficients as you have up until the point where 
the magnitude of your Bessel functions are less than a certain percentage of the maximum height of your carrier. So a sideband is significant if its magnitude exceeds you know, some percent of the unmodulated carrier. So what does that actually mean? So the Bessel coefficient for your carrier is just AC times, you know, the, uh, actually this should be beta, not zero, okay? So this is, that's not zero, this should be beta, all right? Let me just double check here to be sure. Oh, okay then, never mind, I guess it is zero, that's fine. So the unmodul, so okay, yeah, that does make sense, I suppose. So if beta is equal to zero, that means there's no modulation, that, that is correct, okay, that's fine. If beta is equal to zero, that means delta F is equal to zero, so there's no modulation. So if your carrier by itself, there's no modulation, and then what's going to happen is that you're going to have some sideband terms as well, right? They're weighted by AC, and then, you know, you have your best L coefficient. So what you can do is you can figure out the, right, you can figure out the point where, um, you know, as you start drawing the impulses for your best L function, there's a point where you can actually stop, and then that's what we need to figure out. Okay, so what we're going to do in this case, we're going to let x equal 1%. So what we'll do here is that we're going to figure out as many impulses as we need up until the point where the magnitude of your Bissell coefficients, if they're less than 1% of the carrier, then that's when you stop. Okay, so <clears throat> we need to figure out the total number of sidebands, which is n, such that the following relationship holds. So you're going to figure out, you know, 1% of the unmodulated carrier, which is this. Okay, so that means we can cancel out the ACs on both sides. And then we're left with this. And then what we can do is this is equal to 1, basically. All right? It's approximately, you know, it's equal to 1. And then we're left, what we're left with is this. So what we're saying here is that you're going to have your, so the num total number of impulses or the total number of coefficients of your cell that you need are such that you keep including up until a point where it is less than 0 0.01. And if that's the case, then you stop, okay? So there's an actual table that you can use for the best L coefficient. So you don't have to calculate these on your own. There, there, is a, there, there is an actual table that you use to figure out what the actual coefficients are, and it kind of looks like this. And you'll be provided these for your pre-lab as well as the uh, for final exam if these questions are asked, okay? Oh, actually, I'll show that table later, but okay, so if this number n sub max is the largest number of coefficients you want to include, if it's the largest value that satisfies this particular condition, that tells you how many sidebands you need. So all you have to do is, if you want to figure out what the actual bandwidth is, you just figure out you know, how many sidebands you need, and then each sideband is spaced by the fundamental frequency. So from the carrier up until the largest point, that difference is basically just number of coefficients times f of m. And then you have to take a look at the other side as well for the negative parts. So the transmission bandwidth is just this value here. So it's twice because you have to compensate for you know, plus and minus. This number n of max tells you how many sidebands you need to include or how many coefficients you need to include. And then f of m is just your fundamental frequency for the actual wave. So we can use the table of Bessel functions to determine the number of sidebands, which is fine. And I'm going to show you that right now. So it's going to look like this. So this is what the table looks like, all right? So this here, this here is your modulation index. This is beta, so this is your modulation index. Okay? And then it tells you how many coefficients you need. So this thing in red here means that this is the point where you stop. So for example, if I looked at, if this is beta equal to 2.4, you'll notice that at this point here, this is where we stop. So this is telling us here that n of max is equal to 5. So this is telling us here that we only need five sidebands on top of the carrier for it to be deemed significant. So this is telling us here that when you actually draw your, um, you know, your best L coefficient reaction, when you draw the actual frequency spectrum, you're going to have, you know, a pair of impulses that are centered at the carrier, and then you're going to have one, two, three, four, five times the fundamental frequency, and that's it. So in total, you're going to have 12 impulses. So, uh, you know, um, you know, plus minus the carrier, and then you know, one, you know times the fundamental frequency, twice the fundamental frequency, up to five times the amount. Okay, so this thing in right here means that you ignore. So this is what you, you ignore this. So because it's actually less than 0.1. Okay, so if you actually take a look here, if you see all these coefficients here that are less than 0.1, you ignore. And that's what the uh, red, champ, you know, that's what the red signifies. So for example, if I had, you know, my beta is equal to, let's say, 4.4, right? This is telling us here that this is, is where, this is where we stop. So this is telling us that n max equals 7.
So that means that we actually have seven sidebands plus the carry that we have to take into account. So you're actually going to have 16 impulses when you actually draw the actual Bessel coefficient or the Bessel spectrum. Okay? So as you start increasing the modulation index, you'll notice that the total number of sidebands starts to increase because they start to become uh, more and more significant. So as you see here, when you make the modulation index very small, if you take a look at this is point th point 0.2, for example, you'll see that uh, there's only going to be two sidebands. Not two sidebands, you have one sideband plus the, you know, uh, you know, the uh, carrier here. So 0.2 and then 0.4. And then, so you see here that it increases by 0.2. And then as you start increasing, you'll see that the number of sidebands increases. So these are the coefficients that you'd use when you actually draw out your actual spectrum. <clears throat> okay. So this is what happens when you perhaps use the 10% rule. So that means that you're looking for values that are greater than 0 0.1. Now, if you actually take a look, you'll see that the red area starts to shift more towards the left because we're actually making the tolerance even more general. Actually, not general. We're making it even more, uh, even more stringent. So this is telling you that any values that are less than 0.1, you ignore. Okay, so if you take a look here, you'll see that, uh, for example, if beta is equal to 1.6, okay, What's going to happen is if you take a look here, this is less, you know, this is the point where we cut off because anything after this point, these are all less than 0 0.1, so you ignore it. So at beta is 1.6, you're going to have one, you know, two, one pair of impulses that are centered at your fundamental frequency, and then you have one FM and then twice FM. So you're going to have uh, six impulses in total, right? So it depends on which rule you use. You can use 1% or 10%, it's up to you. Okay, so here's the next way. You so there's one way that we actually calculated the uh, bandwidth. So if you actually take a look here, let me just write this out. If you wanted to estimate what the bandwidth is using Bessel coefficients, is just twice the uh, you know the total number of sidebands that you have, and then times your fundamental frequency. So that's if you wanted to use the Bessel functions. Now there's another way to estimate the bandwidth, which is what's known as using a universal curve. Okay. So this has actually been experimentally found. So if you were to be asked a question like this, you will certainly be given this curve on your exam. Okay. So what this is telling you here is that the horizontal axis is a function of the modulation index. Okay. And then the vertical axis gives you a ratio of the desired bandwidth and the frequency deviation. So the x-axis is your modulation index, and the y-axis is your transmission bandwidth over delta F. And then this is the thing that we want. So this is actually what we need. Okay? So <clears throat> let's see here. So let me see here. So uh, if you actually used your, you know, the best cell coefficients from previously, if you actually use that, you can actually tabulate this result here. So this is actually what you see. So let's do a, you know let's do a couple of examples to be in, in, in a little bit but you know this is what you'd use for example this is the one percent rule so if beta is equal to four for example you go up here right this is telling you that you know beta you know the transmission bandwidth over delta f is roughly three point seven okay and we know delta f is equal to kf am over two pi. Okay, so once you substitute this into here, and then you just bring this over here, then you can estimate what the transmission bandwidth would be. So there's actually two different ways to estimate this, and then one of them, depending on which one you use, one of them will overestimate, and another one will underestimate. So it, it's because technically the spectrum of your FN signal is infinite. So you know there's more than one definition, and then we'll take a look at what the differences are soon. Okay, so narrow band frequency modulation, the bandwidth summary. Okay, so. If you have a modulation index that's less than 0.3, okay, so this is your narrow band, then what's going to happen is that your spectrum, your FN spectrum, is only going to be centered at, you know, FC, and then you have uh, plus minus whatever the frequency of your modulated, not much, your message signal would be. So the difference between here and here is just simply twice whatever the fundamental frequency of your wave would be. So this is just for a single tone case. Okay. But we, won't, we haven't talked about any, you know, just arbitrary signals, right? If you just had an arbitrary signal that's not a cosine wave, it could be any wave that you want, you, it's not too far of a stretch to actually uh, do apply the same thing. So instead of the modulation index, we have what is known as the deviation index. So it's almost the same thing, but modulation index is primarily used for single tone. And then deviation is for any general message signal that you have. So notice the difference between this is that you have the height of your message signal, and then here, this is the largest peak. So this is the max height of uh, your message signal, all right? So max height 
of uh, let's see here this is uh, m of t okay so so the only differences really are just between these two so this is the bandwidth of the message Okay, and this is your fundamental frequency. So it's actually very similar because the bandwidth that you'd need for you know sampling your cosine wave, no, not sampling, but the bandwidth for your cosine wave is just simply the frequency itself. And then the bandwidth for your message is just whatever that would be. Okay, so this here is the bandwidth of your message. So it's pretty much almost the same thing. But then notice that the only differences are is that you know this here is the integral of your message, which is that. So it's, that's really the only difference. Okay, so we're going to get on to wideband here. So narrow band is very simple. Okay, all you have to do is just do twice whatever the bandwidth of your message signal is. But then when we take a look at wideband, this is what happens when beta is greater than 0 0.3. Okay, if that's the case, then uh, you have to estimate the bandwidth using different situations. So you can either use Carson's rule if you want. You know, that equation, if you remember, the bandwidth was equal to 2 times delta F plus whatever the bandwidth is of your signal, of your message. Okay, so that's Carson's rule. Or you can use that universal curve, right? So there's either two situations. You can use Carson's rule or that universal curve thing that we talked about before. Okay, so there's, there's two different formulas that you can use. So this is for the single tone case, right? And then this is for the, you know, the message case where you have a general message. So either one is perfectly acceptable. Okay, so comments in the universal curve. Okay, so uh, for any signal, it doesn't have to be a single tone. Okay, you can use the universal curve, and then what you need to do is you have to replace the modulation index with the deviation index, and then the frequency of you know of your actual signal for the uh, for the single tone is just replaced by the signal bandwidth itself. So you can do the same thing. It's just you have to call them a little differently. So the deviation index is, is instead of the modulation index. And the bandwidth would be whatever FM is. So you can just do those re replacements and you're totally fine. Okay. So from the universal curve, right, as you start to make the modulation index very large, you will see that the ratio approaches 2. Okay. So if that's the case, if the ratio approaches 2, that means that if you were to bring this over here, the transmission bandwidth is just going to be twice whatever the uh, frequency deviation would be. So that's something worth noting. Okay, so here are, let me see, so here are, you know, just a, just a quick example, all right? So, uh, you know, let's see, so from the universal curve here, for example, let's say we choose beta to be 0 0.1. So if beta is equal to 0 0.1, then the ratio here is equal to 20, all right? And then what we can do is we can simply bring this over to the right side here. So I would just, you know, multiply up and down by, you know, almost left and right by delta F, and then when you do that, we get this guy over here. Okay, so when you do this, we know that beta is equal to delta F over F of M. Okay, so if I were to bring this over here on that side, this is what you get over here. Okay, so beta FM is equal to delta F. And then when beta is equal to 0 0.1, all right, what's going to happen here is that 20 times 0 0.1 is simply equal to 2. So if the, if the deviation is small, then the actual bandwidth will be approximately twice whatever the fundamental frequency is. So there's two different, uh, there's two different extremes. If your modulation index is very large, then it's just going to be two times delta F as your bandwidth. If your modulation index is very small, it's just going to be two times whatever the fundamental frequency of your actual cosine is. So here are the, uh, here's just the comparison of the extremes. So for narrow band, it's just twice whatever the bandwidth is of your message, or in this for single tone, it's just whatever the actual frequency of your cosine wave is. If it's wideband, if you're going, you know, if it's large, if it's greater than 0.3, then you'd use this instead. You use twice whatever the frequency deviation would be, and then, uh, you know, for you know for intermediate values, so in between very small and very large, you can use Carson's rule or the universal curve if you wish, whatever you want which is just simply, you know, uh, two times the whatever the message is times delta F, or you can use this definition. One, either one of these is perfectly fine. And remember that the beta is just delta F over F of M. Okay, so whatever, whatever, di whatever definition you want to use is perfectly fine. Okay, so the bandwidth of your signal, the actual transmission bandwidth, you can estimate it using Carson's rule. It will 
let me see. It, so it, uh, let me see here. So as you make the modulation index small, right, and if you make it very, very large, then Carson's rule would actually give you the correct transmission bandwidth. So dip on those two extremes, right? Also, if you were to use Carson's rule over the 1% rule for the universal curve, the transmission bandwidth that is estimated by Carson's rule is actually less than the actual one with the 1% rule, with the, uh, you know, with the largest error to be concentrated around beta is equal to 1. So Carson's rule, actually what it does is that it, um, let me see, it displays the effects of the two, okay, so I'm not sure what that is. Let's, let's do one after one. I'm not quite sure what that is. Let's ignore this fact for now, because I actually don't understand what that is. But, okay, and here is my last example, then I'll uh, take a break, and then we'll, and I'll continue uh, frequency modulation in the next, you know, the next part. But let me just finish this first. So, let's uh, estimate the bandwidth for a simple example here. So, uh, you know, for FM broadcasting in North America, the largest frequency deviation that you can incorporate is 75 kilohertz, and the bandwidth of your modulating signal, or the message bandwidth, is equal to 15 hertz, 5 kilohertz. Okay. So, if you wanted to estimate the bandwidth using Carson's rule, you can certainly use this equation here. So, it's just twice whatever the bandwidth of your message is plus whatever the frequency deviation is. Okay. So, you're just doing some substitutions. So, this is 75. This is 15. So, 2 times 90 is just simply 180 kilohertz. So, that's the transmission bandwidth or the bandwidth that you need to send your signal using FM modulation. All right. So, it's kind of significant because your message bandwidth is 15 kilohertz, but when you actually transmit it over frequency modulation, it actually blows up to 180. So that's actually pretty significant, all right? And compared to amplitude modulation, which is just twice the message. So if you wanted to do the 1% rule, okay? So what you'd have to do first is you have to calculate the deviation ratio. Remember, the horizontal axis is defined as beta, or in this case, the deviation ratio. So you have to calculate what that is. So delta F is 75, and your, and your message signal is 15. Okay, in that case, you just set that, you know, 75 divided by 5 is 5. And then you use the horizontal axis. Okay, so my curve, I have to figure out where the 5 mark is, and then I can figure out where my ratio is there. So if you take a look at the, you know, the uh, universal curve, this is where 5 is, and then this is where it lines up here. So this is the ratio that I need. All right, so if you do that, it's roughly equal to 3.2. Okay, so I want to figure out what this value is. Okay, so B, you know, the transmission bandwidth is 3.2 times delta F. And I know what delta F is already. This is 75 kilohertz. So if I compute this, I'll get my transmission bandwidth very easily, which is just 240 kilohertz. So if you take a look at Carson's rule, it's about 180. But if you take a look at the 1% curve, it's 240. So which one do you actually use? Like they're, they're both pretty conflicting in terms of what the actual bandwidth is. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so, oh, you can also uh, use the best cell function if you wish as well. Like the universal curve is actually created off of the best cell functions. So, if your deviation ratio is five, if you take a look, if you're using the one percent rule, then n is equal to eight is the maximum number of sidebands you need. So, if you want to figure out what the transmission bandwidth is, you just do twice times eight, whatever the you know the maximum number, right? So, this is eight over here. Okay, and the times the bandwidth is just 15, so that's equal to 240 as well. So that actually agrees with, uh, you know, the universal curve. So also equal to a uh, universal curve. Okay, and this is the last point I wanted to bring across. So if you have Carson's rule, it's 180 kilohertz, and then if you use the 1% rule, it's 240. So which one do you actually use? Well. In practice, uh, the accepted practice for bandwidth is about 200 kilohertz. So that's what they actually want you to have. That's allocated for each FM transmitter. So Carson's rule underestimates the true bandwidth by about 10%. And the universal rule actually estimates it by over, under, overestimates it by 20%. So it depends on which rule you use. And then, well, this is unfortunately just an approximation. So you have to use one and then kind of stick with it. Maybe you can come to a compromise and maybe take the average of the two or just stick with maybe Carson's rule because it un, you know, underestimating is better than over sometimes, or you could use the 1% rule if you, if you have the electronics to support that. Okay, so let's take a break, uh, come back, and I'm going to finish FM. should take about maybe half an hour more, and then I'll do some review questions, then we'll get out of here by 8 o'clock.